Most of the work that I do is in experimental aerodynamics, and, and very often the work that, that I, I focus on is something that has arisen sort of serendipitously. And uh, this, semester, this past semester I had uh, three excellent students, uh, Mike Lapani, Tom Balistrieri, and Yakov Mikhailov, who wanted to do a senior design project with me. And it so happened that uh, late last year, a former student had called me up. He was working in Maryland, and he was working on a, uh, a, a project involving the um, a suspension bridge, which had um, uh, uh, cables that were sheathed in, in, in uh, um, a, a covering. One of the particular problems with these cables is that uh, over time they can start to corrode because humidity accumulates, particularly in the bottom part of the suspension area. So some uh, people had come up with the idea of blowing air through the cables inside the sheathing to keep them dry and, and, and consequently last much longer in service. But one of the things that the, this particular company, the student, wanted to uh, check on was what was the amount of air that was flowing through? Could they monitor it easily on the bridge? Well, I saw that this was something that lent itself very well to an experimental study in, in our low turbulence subsonic wind tunnel that, that we have. So I took these three students and, and, and we came up with a, a system that uh, involved uh, sending compressed air through a tube uh, and flowing out into the oncoming uh, wind tunnel speed. So that, that's what you refer to as a counterflow. My name is Michael Pani. I'm Yakov Mikhailov. My name is Thomas Balistrieri. And we're in Hofstra's wind tunnel lab, where we are studying a counterflow phenomenon for our senior design. The point of this experiment is to study the counterflow characteristics of a flow going through a tube with an opposing headwind going at it. We simulated wind by using a subsonic wind tunnel here and injected compressed air through this small model to simulate opposing flows. The way we acquired our data is by using a data acquisition system. It could take up to 20,000 samples of data per second, but the way we measured the velocity is by using a special probe called a hot wire anemometer. It uses a little, very thin piece of metal thinner than a human hair. It's cooled off a certain amount by the oncoming air, which changes its resistance, which then is converted to a voltage and tells us the velocity that we're measuring. The way we acquired this data was by using this brand new traverse that Hofstra University just got. Instead of manually changing the X, Y, and Z position of it, we can just input the commands into the computer and have the traverse move as we please. The traverse can move in increments of five ten thousandths of an inch, which gives very accurate data. So it was an excellent experience for them, using some of the new equipment, as I mentioned before, the three-dimensional automated traverse that presented its own problems. Here we can see the traverse taking automated measurements in a streamwise direction and then moving vertically once it finishes spanning a certain distance. These increments we put into the computer beforehand and it's very helpful because we can just repeat the test at different environmental conditions with just a click of a button. They had set up a system where uh, they were going to try to use some sort of flow measuring device to actually monitor the, the flow rate of the air uh, as it came out through an exit duct on the bridge and could be monitored real time. See that bubble in front? Right at the top. Or is that just a boundary layer? Really just the first one. Mm -hmm. Showed a boundary layer, and then the rest were just 
and you were moving it along the along the line. yeah along the tube. The flow is very complex, and an awful lot of different measurements can be made, particularly the growth of the boundary layer on top of the tube, the interaction between the flow coming out and the flow coming at it. That's cool. <laughs> Yeah. There's a lot of dimensioning to be done and uh, positioning, uh, diagrams, uh, uh, creating of the uh, prototypes, or the, the, the models. students really set to work with a vengeance and, and spent I don't know how many hours a day, uh, probably put in at least 20 or 30 hours a week if not more, for several weeks and came up with some beautiful results. So here's some data from our 60 feet per second wind tunnel speed comparing no compressed air with compressed air. So this is the mean velocity profile of the boundary layer at different streamwise positions on top of the tube. So you can see that before compressed air they all follow a nice smooth pattern, but when compressed air is introduced, it changes the boundary layer significantly. So it looks like the compressed air is, is adding to the profile down near the bottom. Definitely. You could see some more lines. Some lines are, have a fuller boundary layer. And subtracting at the top. And subtract. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that actually looks more like a classic boundary yeah. layer profile there than do those ones there. I agree. Those results were impressive enough that uh, now that the dust has settled and the semester is over, um, Professor Vaccaro and I are going to be analyzing that data and preparing it for a, a, a technical publication because we really think that we've done some work that's uh, quite interesting and uh, there's nothing quite like it in the literature. And there's several journals out there that I think would be very interested in publishing the results that, that we've uh, formulated here. So uh, it was an excellent experience uh, for the students and it's an excellent experience for both of us as faculty members.